Um, super excited for for this event here. Um, you know, I think, especially as we're as we're entering, you know, some really really busier time of year. I think it's important to kind of continually focus on on the numbers, right, and on the financials. Um, you know, and and I think that if if you can get into this habit instead of you know, kind of, kind of pushing it back, you know, a little bit further till, till after, um, you know, a lot of the work is done. I think you kind of lose out on some of the opportunity to hit some of the profitability goals. Um, so if, you know, if, if you guys haven't heard about cycle CPA, so we're a remote accounting firm, do anything from bookkeeping CFO to, to tax services specifically within companies in the green industry. So currently we serve a couple hundred companies, you know, within, uh, you know, within the country. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I'm here alongside uh, Carla, the other co-founder, one of the CPs here as well. So. Yes. Nice to, to see you all. Thank you for joining us. We're super excited to bring some clarity on the financial side for green industry businesses. Yeah. And I think even, even if you've been to some of our webinars in the past, I think we have, we have a lot of, um, you know, some a different perspective here, along with even in the beginning, just some of the review for I know some of you had 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 reached out kind of wanting a refresher on on some of the, um, you know, some some of the accounting basics as well. Right. Um, so this is kind of what what we're going to be covering today, everything from kind of looking back into the past and learning from what happened. Right. This this past winter, um, looking at how we can diagnose some of the inefficiencies, allocating of some of the resources. Um, you know, really, really trying to try to give you give those of you that that are looking to grow, um, you know, really some major things to consider within that. You know, we we see a lot of the common issues. Right. And that's why we're here. That's why I think this time that you guys are spending with us is really, really huge, because I think what it comes down to is learning from from other people's mistakes. Right. And learning it in places like like this. So. When it comes to last year, you know, even even this this past slow season, you know, I think that it's important to um, have this conversation now because after busy season, right, as you're entering next winter, it's sometimes too late to make certain decisions and certain changes within a company. Um, so think about what happened this past winter, right? And what a lot of it comes down to is within a seasonal business. A year long budget is is important because you can be in the busy season making 20 percent net profit and you can think that that's a great mark. Right. But at the end of the day, you may have additional expenses and other liabilities within within the off season um, that that you have to account for. And and the only way to know that is if you do build a, that that year long budget. You also, you know, and, and, and it may not really depend much on the profitability. Right. But your problem may actually be more with just the terms which your customers are paying you, right? So making sure that you're adjusting that, you know, are there times that, you know, maybe you should be collecting more from the customer or more ahead of time, right? Um, making sure that that you're building a cash reserve, which we're going to get to in this presentation, timing of the tax payments, right? So um, this is that time of year, right? But instead of, you know, waiting until this time of year, maybe you can make those quarterly payments for the taxes um, to, to kind of spread that that uh, liability out throughout the year. Another big thing is, you know, even as you're going through through this year, if if you're going to reach peak times with with your work, instead of hiring full time W2 employees, is it possible to replace that with more of a flexible subcontractor or mix in different options where it becomes easier to you know, basically thr throttle down within the off season, right? Um, and think about offering additional services um, and then looking at even not only just reducing some of the fixed costs and some of those costs that don't vary from, from month to month, but, but, but also timing of some of the major purchases, whether it's the equipment and, 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 and vehicles, right? So these are all things that you want to start considering now. Right. Because this is when when you're going to start to be receiving some of the funds and you want to be able to kind of allocate that up appropriately. Some of the things that that we saw this past year, um, which was the 
long care and maintenance divisions um, of the companies that that we work with grew at a rate of 18 percent more of the install based services grew in revenue around 21 percent and those that had pretty much an even mix of both grew at around 13.7 percent which which means right the companies that that had more of a specialty within one service line actually ended up growing faster um, probably because of the in, the efficiencies that are uh, there when when you focus in on one one service line and it's also a note here where not not only did did they grow on the top line more but those that were predominantly in one service line saw more than 33 percent higher return on their fixed assets like their equipment and trucks also they saw 1.7 times more return on equity kind of like the return they're getting on on their business right so wow. definitely something to to consider um, you know as you're as you're thinking about expanding you know maybe you know yes you know maybe adding a service line in the winter could could help but yeah. when you're thinking about the busy season sometimes the answer is you know finding that profitable service or what your company does best and really trying to capitalize and scale that and we're going to go through unit economics and and things to look at when you're scaling a landscape company but this is an important figure i think that 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 was worth sharing yeah i think that's really cool and it just goes to show like really having a specialty makes a difference in your financials but now we're going to go into your financials and pretty much you have your profit and loss you have your balance sheet and your cash flow statement so here we have a profit and loss. So of course we start off with the revenue, which is the money that you receive for services and then the cost of services. So this is directly linked to um, the expenses that you're tying out or relating to providing those services. So like your materials, direct labor, subcontractors, disposal fees, all of those direct expenses. And then after that, you get your gross profit. So you have your revenue minus cost of services, and then you have your gross profit. And then you have your overhead expenses. So those expenses that are really not directly tied to your, um, like to you providing the services. So marketing, insurance, software, office supplies, things of that nature. And then you have your net profit, which is your revenue minus all services. I mean, all um, expenses, direct and indirect. It's the money that's left over at the end of the day. Yeah. And for, for those of you that are just joining us, you know, definitely mention your questions in the chat. We're going to get to those, um, you know, either as they, as it comes up or, or at the end of the webinar. And, you know, we definitely want to just, you know, emphasize some of the basics here as, as we continue on, um, you know, into, into other topics within the webinar. Yeah, we'll get a little bit more granular on things. And then your balance sheet. A lot of business owners have a more hard like time understanding the balance sheet. Even some accountants do, to be fair. And it is, it is, it, it is a really cool financial statement because it tells you a lot about your business and it's very important about, um, important financial because it tells you a lot about your cash flow um, and what you own and, and stuff. And we'll go through that. But I always like to use this analogy. So a lot of us probably do have a mortgage that we're paying on and um, a home. So think about um, your home being your asset, right? What you own in um, is your home and that house value. Um, but then you also owe um, your mortgage, right, to your bank. Um, so that's your liability. And then you also have equity in your home, which was or is your down payment, right? So same thing with the financial statement. So in your financial statement, in your landscaping business, you have your assets. So that's what you, uh, your company owns right and that's your bank accounts your accounts receivable things that benefit your company 
um, like your equipment, vehicles, trucks, all of those items that help the business move forward and what you own. Then you have your liabilities, what you owe to others. So you have what you owe is like your credit cards, you owe payroll liabilities, you owe Sheffield loans, Ford loans, everything like that. And then you have your equity. What it, This is what you own in the business. So, um, and that consists of retained earnings, which is just a fancy way of saying like all of the profits or losses that you've made in the business since the beginning of, of the business, since when you started, it's an accumulated number. Um, it's also made up of owner's draw. So if you take money out of the business, that's going to decrease um, your equity. Um, and then, of course, net income profits, that increases your equity. So here's like a little accounting equation at the bottom. If you see that your assets, right, it's that green bar, but it's made up of like liabilities and equity. So liabilities plus equity equals assets. So all of those things balance in the balance sheet. Yeah, and we, we, we also have a, have a past webinar where we did a deep dive into a balance sheet. Um, so you can go to our YouTube channel, Cycle CPA, um, and uh, yeah, you, you can definitely check it out there. And I know some some people, you know, when they're kind of going throughout the, the season, you know, it kind of seems like, you know, sometimes you're making profits, but your bank balance was kind of lower than, than you expected, right? Has, has, has anyone experienced that? Um, you know, I think it's kind of the, the reality at certain, certain points of, you know, when you're running a company. I always get that question yeah. a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. And so the other financial statement, statement of cash flow, right? So, so you're looking at things like cash flow from, from operations, right? It's, it's the operating expenses, maybe the depreciation, also taking into account net income, um, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Then, then you're taking into account cash flow from investing, right? So this is things that are involved with things like, like asset purchases, like your equipment or vehicle purchasing. Also looking at cash flow from, from financing, right? So whether you have vehicle or equipment loans and, and ultimately, you know, you have cash at the beginning of the period, cash at the end of the period, and then your net cash from that period, right? So, so basically what, what direction did your bank balance go in? And, as you're as we're looking at some of these financial statements, I think a big I think something, you know, in, an issue that that can arise is it could be relatively intimidating. Right. Or it could be overwhelming into what what should we focus on. Right. And I think that's why it's important to delineate between. Basically, what are the metrics? Right. What are all of the possible data points that that, that you can look at within a company? Versus, okay, now let's narrow it down a little bit into, okay, what are some of the per performance indicators? So maybe some of those, some of those metrics that are, give you a little bit more view into what's going on in the company, how the company's performing, but then you're ultimately narrowing that down even further to KPIs, right? Or key performance indicators. The, these are those, those metrics that are, are important to track, right? And, and ultimately, Ideally, you're basically looking at these metrics and you're able to manage a company and really measure the performance of a company. So when you look at all of those financial statements as as we as we went through, um, you know, I, th I think that, you know, yes, sometimes it's good to look at a specific metric, but there is not one metric that really gives the whole picture of, of the financial health of the company. Right. You know, your your net profit may be super high, but on the other side, maybe your net cash flow is low, right? Because of maybe some things going on within the company. Um, you know, maybe your gross profit, right, which is an important metric within this industry. Maybe that's really high, but maybe your overhead is excessive, right? So that's why it's important to to, to always look at the full picture of a company, right? And and ultimately find a way to almost as if you were to go to a doctor's office to get a you know really kind of get a check on what's going on in your body, really, ideally, you want to do the same thing within your business and try to find out, okay, what's what's the financial health of the company? And you can ultimately break it down into 
a couple different sections, right? And these are some of the things that we like to focus on when we're looking at green industry financials, right? You have things that impact profitability of the company, things that impact efficiency. And within a service-based company, labor is the biggest, has the biggest impact on efficiencies. Liquidity, right? So we're talking about cash flow. You know, how are we able to, um, you know, keep up with some of the liabilities and some of the upcoming payments? Asset usage, right? So um, how much revenue are these assets producing? How, how new are the assets relative to other companies in the industry? So these are, th- this is a way that you can go from those metrics, right? All of those different items and, and you can really narrow it down. And if you're with, with Cycle CPA, this is stuff that you see within the Cycle Scape reporting. Even, even if you're not, you can ask your accountant, right? Listen, can you calculate some of these ratios for me, right? So I can get an idea of, of what's going on within the company. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of people always ask us, like, what key metrics should I track? It's like, you know, those would be where I would get started for sure. The ones that Joe had listed. Yeah. And not only do you want to be able to see what those ratios are, but but you want to be able to see how your company relates to the industry average. Um, and there's some... Uh, There's some resources out there, whether it's the National um, Association for Landscape Professionals. um, They may have some benchmark studies. The issue with that sometimes is you don't know if you're comparing apples to apples. Now, with our internal clients, we have benchmarks, right? So basically for companies that do install work or maybe more of the recurring maintenance and lawn care, basically pairing that up, right? So you could basically look at each individual category and see how your company aligns when compared to your peers, right? And sure, each company is slightly different. Each company optimizes it in a different way, but this gives you a general um, point that you can start from um, in in regard to each section. Like within this company, you can see, you know, it it looks like maybe they're not utilizing their assets as well as maybe other companies in, in the industry. Why is that, right? It's something to kind of look into. On the other side, it looks like leverage, right? So it, it looks like they're not over leveraged. They don't have too much debt. Looks like they're managing their cash flow and liquidity pretty well. You know, definitely some area to improve. Even some area to improve within their field and overhead labor efficiencies, um, right? So so these are all things that we want to focus on. And, and ultimately, as a leader of a company, right, as a, as a manager, these are things that you want to look at, right? And, 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 because things get busy, right? Um, especially this time of year. So you want to be able to look at things like this instead of waiting until the end of the year, almost just getting stuff done just for compliance and tax purposes. Yeah, it's so easy. Where a lot of fun stuff happens. Yeah, it's so e- and it's so easy to and clear to see, like, what do I need to work on as a business owner? Like, we, as a business owner, we have so many things on our plate every single day, and it's hard to be like, okay, what should I focus on? What is going to move the needle the most? And like having something like this is just so clear to me that I need to work on my asset usage, right? In my company, you know, how can I utilize my truck equipment better, you know, and stuff like that. So I like how clear it is. And then when you have some of these, some of these KPIs, right? Some of these metrics. One of the benefits is that you can really dial in and see where your company is is inefficient. And something that um, you know, something that you should focus on, right? And 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 be aware of as you're as you're planning out and budgeting for for the new year is that inefficiencies typically hide in places that you know where it's a larger department size, right? Or it's a new division, right? Because it, it, it takes time along with like a new service line, right? It, 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 it takes time to basically, um, you know, find out what is the best process, right? Because you may have not even had a job cost report yet. You don't even know, you know, if, if you're performing the job in a way that aligns with the way that you're estimating it. Um, even new employees. I mean, everyone knows here, it's, you know, it could take months you know, half a year in order to get people really to that 
point where where they're efficient, right? They're they're able to kind of operate with uh, you know limited oversight. So, um, and then also it's it's important to also consider, especially for smaller companies, where you know you, you still have a connection to what's happening in the field or more of a connection. Usually, in those circumstances, it's more of a pricing issue, right? Because Efficiencies, typically the business owner and what's connected to the business owner in, in, in field operations, typically that's going to be the most efficient you're ever going to be. So definitely something to to consider. Um, and and here's an example, right, of, of, of how you can really dial down into, um, you know, some of the items that you may need to work on, right, where some of those inefficiencies may be hiding within a company which is better than looking at just your net profit or, okay, this is my, my bank balance is not, you know, going, going down too much. So I, I, I must be fine, but how do you, you know, how does that give you confidence in order to make some changes and, um, you know, really help your company, uh, you know, progress. Right. So th this helps you get more specific into each item. So looking at, revenue growth, right? So looks like this company grew a little bit slower than what the industry was was doing. Um, and which is which is not a bad thing, right? Some companies don't want to grow that much. But on the other side of it, if if a company's not growing as much, you should almost be more profitable, right? Companies with high growth may be a little bit um, less profitable at times, right? Because of some of the other circumstances that I'm going to even cover later in this webinar. Um, you know, but but even looking at salaries and field labor wages, right? This company, um, although it improved from from last year, um, it it is a little bit higher than than the industry median, right? Industry median for that category was fourteen percent. They're at around twenty percent. They're in the second percentile, um, and uh, you know, it's 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 an example of something where you know we can kind of focus in on that point and say, okay, what are what are things that we may need to improve? Was it due to maybe a couple of new staff or, you know, was it, was it due to, you know, maybe we should just get better equipment, right. And be able to utilize the equipment better and uh, thus lowering that percentage. Right. So there's, there's a lot of different factors that, that go into it. Um, and, but, but ultimately, you know, just as you can never look at one metric and it can really give you, it can really give you kind of that that um, definite answer of how you're doing in that specific category. Yeah, your your field labor in this example may be high, but at the end of the day, look at where your where your cost of goods are or or your direct costs. Um, they're you're you're doing pretty well, right? So you're you're operating slightly below the industry median here. Um, I'd say that there's a little bit of room to improve, right? But ultimately, you know, I think each company optimizes in their own way, right? You can even see this company, you know, they they don't use that much subcontracted labor, right? But the average in the industry is around eight percent. So, you know, I think sometimes as a as a business owner, you have to look at the whole picture, um, and sometimes you can't get too fixated on certain certain granular items. I think sometimes you do have to take a step back and and you know, look at some of the overarching KPIs that are going to impact the company. Yeah, and I see some some of you guys are putting your questions in the chat. I'm loving it. Um, just know that we are going to go over those questions um, towards the end of the of the uh, presentation here. Yeah, and so within this. Uh, within this, some of the 2023 data. So based on our clients, it looks like for more of the recurring services within the green industry, field labor was around 29%, close to 30. Insulo based services were around 15%, right? This is this is one of the biggest things that, that drives revenue, right? So when you're looking at trying to find inefficiencies, you wanna start, start there. Also looking at overhead labor, right? So lawn care and maintenance, was was around ten percent. Install based services was closer to nine percent. So these are things that you want to track. And um, these metrics were for companies that were actually above five hundred thousand in revenue. Um, but 
we also have have the other metrics if you happen to be uh, below that as well. So, um, you know, these are definitely something to to consider as you're growing, especially. Um, now, you want to utilize the financials to help your company, especially as a as a competitive advantage, right? In in your market, um, and I really do believe that companies that know know your numbers and it's a commonly used term right know your numbers but it's it's incredible how it can really you know propel companies right because you can get to the point where you're confident about your estimates right and you can you know you can turn down some jobs right because you you know that if you were to do it it wasn't going to be profitable for you so you know the this this accurate accounting work um, it leads to accurate budgeting especially if you have a crm or project management software um, like synced up um, for instance or lmn you know these are these are things that you want those budget budgets to be accurate not based on just solely on what you hear from other people you want to be based on your numbers your accounting numbers because that's how you're going to come up with your pricing and, and your estimating. So if you leave out something like depreciation and you're not accounting for that 3%, now all of a sudden you go from 15% to 3%. And the, the whole point of that is you want to put yourself in a position where you can control as much as possible, right? Because there's a lot of things in business that you can't control that are out of your control, right? Maybe some weather incidences or staff um, issues or things that come up. But if you know that, you know, these things are needed within the company, please try to, you know, really put an emphasis on it because then you're going to be able to control your costs more, right? After you know your numbers, you're going to be able to have this data to make some of the important decisions within the company. Maybe you're looking to purchase equipment and trucks um, and also to manage risk, right? That's a big thing. Companies don't go out of business because, you know, because they maybe mess up on a customer's property once, you know, or companies go out of business because they, you know, they reach cash flow issues, right? Um, and I'm sure some of you have heard, heard some of those statistics. But, you know, these are, you know, this is definitely something to, to emphasize. And when you're thinking about cost control, right, which was, which was one of those points, you know, and how you can basically – build this out as a competitive advantage for for your company looking at it as as an example here right so company b versus maybe company a was another company in your market right both you know estimated that job at 155 labor hours the cost of sales or all those direct costs per every hour for company b was 80 hours 80 dollars per hour company a was was 80 dollars an hour so it's the same right it's the same the material was going to cost the same Paying, paying the, the employees in the field was going to cost the same for both companies. However, overhead, right? Overhead for company B, because they don't track their numbers, because they don't um, look at ways to optimize and um, optimize their processes with their administrative team, because they wait till the end of the year, look at their financials, their overhead that they need to recoup for every hour is $29. Whereas company A, company A knows their numbers, they they revisit it frequently and they find ways to cut costs or find ways to gain efficiencies. Their overheads at $24 an hour. Each of them, they want to build in 50% profit. And you can see that the total hourly rate for company B is going to have to be higher, right? Because their overhead was higher and their bid's going to be higher. And that's going to lead most likely to the fact that they might not get that job, right? Um, and sure, there's there's other factors and different things. Company B may have a, you know, an amazing sales process that just wows the customer, um, which I hope all of you do. But this is kind of taking all of those other factors out of the equation, um, you know, and 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 ultimately putting yourself in the best position where, you know, you can walk away, right? If it this is the bid that you have, you know, you're going to recoup your costs, and 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 that's what's going to be. And then ultimately taking some of these numbers 
right? Because now, now you have some of the clarity into the KPIs and, and, and finding ways to not only hold yourself accountable to that, right. But, but holding your team accountable, especially as you grow and maybe you have different departments or different people that you're, um, you know, that are going to be reporting to you. Um, and the first step of this is you need accurate and timely data, right? That's, that's a must. Um, and there's no shortcut to that, unfortunately. Um, and it, it is something that I know a lot of companies want to practice things like open book management and, um, you know, implement different things like that. But if you make an implementation like that, you, you need to make sure that you have the process within your account department to basically support that first. You also want to make sure that, that, that your employees have the financial literacy to understand it. And oftentimes you can start with building up their personal financial literacy, right? Helping your employees and, and, and giving them an, an idea of, okay, how can they, how can they help themselves by learning how to budget for their personal finances, right? And, and try to carry over that same thinking and that same mindset over into the business, right? And, and then ultimately your ability as the owner through visiting presentations like this, looking at videos in our, in our YouTube channel, um, getting educated on the financials, you need to have the ability to present this with confidence to your employees. Because if you're not confident, then they're going to doubt it. And, you know, they may not buy in as much, right, to, to certain metrics that, that you're saying. You know, I think it becomes more powerful instead of saying, well, listen, guys, you know, we need to hit this, this amount this week. Instead of that, you could say, you know, listen, team, in order to hit the, the 50% gross profit, which is the industry average, you know, we need to hit this number, you know, and these are different things that we can do to pretty much do that. And if we do, then there's a possibility that we can, you know, have additional bonuses and, you know, build more opportunities for the team. And, and ultimately you want everyone moving in the same direction, right? You don't want some people's incentives to be, um, not not aligned with with another teams right you want everyone to kind of work work in the same direction um some of you that may have heard uh um uh, heard of warren buffett um you know he's a he's a famous investor but one of the people that have has helped to kind of operate his companies alongside him charlie munger mentioned show me the incentive and i will show you the outcome right so how are we talking to the team right how how are we developing the processes and having those conversations where, you know, yes, you know, it's great to get a job done under a certain amount of time, but on the other side, if we're only incentivizing based on that, where does the quality go? Right. Where does, where does that go? Right. Where does the culture of the company go? So um, you always want to consider all the different factors. And when you're considering performance pay, you want to make sure that whatever you're basing that that employee's performance on, that it's in their control, right? And and sure, there are various factors that you know may impact it, right? But for the most part, um, you know, this is something like like in field labor, for instance. Sure, you know, ideally you would want field labor to. Um, you know, really look at the net profit of the company and say, yeah, you know, if that's a certain number, you know, we're going to, um, you know, have, have an additional bonus. But at the end of the day, just because you, you decide to spend more on marketing, it shouldn't necessarily affect field labor's um, potential performance pay or variable pay. Right. So um, some companies do it as a, as a percent of revenue. Right. So for an install based company, your, your goal may be 18% of revenue for the year or for a given time period. Um, and if they fall within that number, um, you know, or even if they exceed it, then you can give them really a, a big portion of what, whatever that difference is, right? Um, maybe you have management within the company or, or as part of the administrative team, right? Their main goal is to basically manage operations and make sure things are running smoothly, right? Which really relates to gross profit. Right. So maybe their goal is 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 the gross margin of 50 percent of revenue. And then you have the executives. Right. These are people that may be 
you know, really your second in command or go to person to really help manage the company. These are the kind of people that you can measure based off the net profit of the company. Right. Um, you know, so when you're thinking about performance pay, remember, you want to have the system set up ahead of time and you want to make sure that you're you're giving this information to the team in a confident way. And, um, you know, and, and, and I would say even, you know, start off very conservatively, you know, start off, you know, with, with something that you know that you can keep up with. And part of, part of when you're looking at the, the financials as a, as a leader within a company, you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, where, where am I going to put these funds, right? Where, where should I put my attention, right? Where, where should our team really think about scaling into? Within a cash flow forecast or within any forecasting, similar to when you're allocating resources, you could do scenario planning, right? So if you look at different things, like you're going to purchase a piece of equipment or you're going to expand or you're going to add on a crew, how is that going to impact profits of the company? Also, you want to stay as active as possible when you're allocating resources within the company. And an example of this is, you know, if if you see that you have excessive funds, um, almost like excessive reserve capital within a company in July, it's it's a lot better to act based on allocating those resources as soon as possible because every month that you wait, there's an opportunity cost to that, right? So you could have spent those funds and that's why it's important sometimes and to not put, put, put off reviewing your financials because, you know, it's there, like I said, there's a, there's a big opportunity cost to that though that, that money could have been making money for you um, in, in, in other ways. Um, like reinvesting back into like advertising, right? Or yeah. up in your advertising budget. Exactly. And when 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 you're looking at these things, you can think about the long-term impact versus the short-term goals, right? Because sometimes when you make a certain decision in a company, it's important to think it through because at on the other side of it, you want to allow the time for it to actually play out, right? And, and, and I think it's unfair to a certain degree, um, you know, that, that, that you don't let that decision play out, right? Um, you know, whether it's giving someone a shot, you know, maybe you had promoted them or, um, you know, even, even giving that person the, the resources and, and the tools in order to succeed in their role, right? So, um, and then also thinking about, you know, especially as a, as a leader within a company, each team member is going to have their own bias, right? The the CEO may not necessarily, um, you know, he, they may, or or like the management team, they're a little bit more separated from from the customer at points, right? So they're going to have a little bit different of a perspective. They they may look a little bit more just the bottom line, whereas maybe your account managers they know a lot more of you know, listen, you know, the, these certain things will definitely affect customer satisfaction, right? Um, or the field employees, you know, they, they may have a, sp a, a strong opinion based on a piece of equipment, which may not align as much with the CFO wants, but, you know, and, and that's why as, as the leader of a company, you need to basically weigh all of those different opinions together and not just see what is the best financially at times, but, you know, cause, cause some things may be good in the short term, right? But, what are some of the long-term implications to that as well? And when you're allocating resources, one of the most important things is, is to make sure that you're breaking your company down into segments, whether it's the service lines or divisions, um, because ultimately that's, you know, a company that is, that is not as profitable and scaling a certain division, does it deserve additional funds, right? Mm -hmm. or, or should you focus more in on that department that's, really killing it, right? And even going back to one of the first slides that we went over today, well, maybe that is the best decision. Maybe you should just, you know, we, we see companies all the time where they say, listen, 
it was a nice, you know, it was nice being able to offer this service line, but it's just not working out. It's it, it's not worth the energy and the opportunity cost to try to fix per se. It's better to just capitalize on this other division, which we're just killing it with, right? So, um, all or things- location too. Like we just saw a company where they they weren't doing good in this one location because there there just wasn't like enough of a target market there there wasn't much of a market because it was a remote location and stuff so you know after um i think it was like two years like you know of of showing them that that recurring you know effect and how it negatively impacted profits you know decided to shut it down finally and they're able to focus on their more profitable location yeah and companies get to that point you know especially companies just starting out or maybe companies opening up a new division sometimes it's nice to be able to see a lot of volume flowing through but at the end of the day there's a lot of risk that that comes with more volume so you need to make sure that there's profits and you know that there's some sort of reward coming from that when it comes to resource allocation you also look at some some of the core things within any service-based company right making sure that the team members a match with the skill level, right? That that they're able to basically perform that given task. So, a manager shouldn't be performing data entry, right? The um, someone that that is specialized in operating a piece of equipment, they shouldn't be, you know, doing a lot of administrative work or just driving around. Maybe just a vehicle, you know, getting materials from from the nursery because someone forgot it, right? So, really thinking about how can we maximize that? You utilizing the right equipment for that specific job. I was in a call with with someone the other day, and it was a great comment they made. They said, "I I get jobs that I know I can use my equipment well with, and that is simple, you know, right? <laughs> that's almost that could be translated into okay. I'm getting jobs that I know I could be most efficient with." Right. And I think it's important to think in terms of that. Right. Because when you have these assets and the cost of these assets and 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 the cost of of the personnel in the company, how are you basically taking that and making sure that that you're driving revenue as much as you can? Right. Um, You know, instead of thinking about, oh, maybe I can, you know, purchase that piece of equipment because I can use it in some of the jobs. And, you know, these are things that that you really need to consider yeah. um, and and think about the the ROI right and because you're not going to scale a company trying to cut costs the whole way it's it's just not possible um, and there's only so much you can cut costs by but you can grow revenue as as much as you want right so always always think about ROI not only in the field using equipment and um, certain processes, but also in the office using technology and software as well. And when you're growing a company um, and when you're allocating resources, sure, you, you want to think about some of those other factors, but ultimately your company is only going to grow on, until you reach certain capacity in certain areas. All right. So yeah, you may love spending time in the field and you may love that, but you know, and on on the other side of it, you you really want to grow, but in reality, most of your time should actually be spent within other parts of your company, right? Because that's where capacity is about to be hit. Maybe it's human resources and recruiting, right? So are your funds being allocated to make sure that you're not hitting full capacity or or that you're not hitting stress within those certain departments? Right. And that's how you can basically look at it. It's a it's it's a very simplistic way. But, you know, match your funds with with those departments that that need it. Right. That that may prevent you from scaling. Yeah, we'll talk about cash flow management next. Um of course, this is a very seasonal business. And so cash flow and managing that is super important. 
So first we'll go over liquidity measures, like working capital. So what is liquidity? It's, you know, the cash flow in your business and how well are you going to be able to cover those upcoming short term liability? So how are you going to be able to cover your Capital One credit card um, bill or that sales tax bill or upcoming payroll? And so one thing that you could do to measure those things and how well you're going to be able to to cover them is um, the working capital um, equation, which is current assets minus current liabilities, which current assets just means like your bank account balance, your accounts receivable balance minus your current liabilities, you know, uh, again, your sales tax, your credit card bills, stuff like that. And then you could also calculate your current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. And if you get that and you get something that is greater than 1.5, that means that you're going to be able to cover your upcoming uh, liabilities. And so these are two great um, ratios to look at within your business to make sure that you have enough funds in the short term to be able to cover your payroll costs, sales tax, credit card bills, um, stuff like that. And I know that people, you know, are extremely um, concerned about their short term um, costs and being able to cover those because you're you're needing to make these decisions every day about how you know and you can't really make those decisions just by looking at the at your bank account balance right because that is now like that's your current bank account balance you're not really looking at okay what am I gonna owe in my like my capital one card the next month and do I have enough funds to to cover that so these two ratios would be great to to look at. What are some other considerations in regard to to cash flow, right? So companies that are doing the one-time work, maybe, maybe hardscape, softscape, outdoor living, very different than re reoccurring base services like maintenance and lawn care, right? And these two different business models, cash flow is going to consider um, going to vary widely, right? So um, companies that do a lot of install work, purchasing the materials up front, um, you know, making sure that, that you have – um, enough that you're collecting in regard to progress payments, but also that you're separating your progress payments into enough amount of payments, right? Um, so making sure that if you are going to be adding on a service line with, you know, with a different business model, whether it's one-time work or reoccurring, that you're considering these in your yearly budget. And also considering commercial versus residential, right? Sometimes commercial is not always the best option. We work with companies that are very profitable in commercial or residential, but it, it, it more comes down to how your company is designed, right? If you're working commercial, un understanding that the payment terms are not going to be ideal, right? For a residential customer, they're going to typically pay you when you tell them to, right? Um, commercial, they're driven just like you. They're a business. They're driven by profits. They're going to try to drag it out as much as possible sometimes. So you want to consider all these things, right? So if you're thinking about commercial, understand that, yes, you you might get those larger payments. You know, getting one contract means a lot more revenue, but there are some downsides to that as well. And and, and you want to be aware of that on the on the cash flow side. Also, do, do all of your staff, both administratively and in the field, do they understand how their role impacts cash flow, right? Because as as a business owner, don't be the only one that cares about certain things. Whether it's in administratively, maybe it's accounts receivable and collecting, right? Someone may have an administrative role where doing 30 different things. Maybe they're answering the calls or they're talking to people on the phone or whatever it is, but do they understand the importance of collecting? right? Of accounts receivable. Tell them, listen, this is a huge priority for the company. We we need to hit these specific well, benchmarks. Well, I know a client that like, they will communicate like their accounts receivable to 
their staff and they're like XYZ client hasn't paid us and stuff like that. And actually it's funny because their team, while they're on um, the property will be like, yeah, um, my, you know, they said that you owe this and when can you get us paid? So when can you get us paid? And like, they become yeah. part of it, a part of that conversation and they help with collections in that way. So even if, it's not part of like their job, you know, AR collections, but if you make them part of the conversation, I mean, they're part of your team. They're going to be out there working for you. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that goes for, you know, the whole idea of getting everyone moving in the same direction within your company, right? Because the same thing goes with the administrative team. Maybe, you know, yes, they're, they're not the ones maybe going out to the property and selling, but maybe because they picked up the the phone and, they spoke very politely and very professionally. They actually almost sold the customer before the salesperson even came out, right? Because they started a conversation with them and they really understood what, what their needs were, right? So, um, you know, making sure that that everyone's aware of that stuff. And then on, on the other side of it, you know, I think it's a great problem to have. But, you know, when you have an excess amount of reserve capital or cash reserve, um, certain things to kind of watch out for, you know, is, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, are, are you basically putting these funds, you know, you know, are you, are you losing out somewhere, right? Like maybe you should at least put in a high yield savings account or, um, you know, maybe you should invest it back into your company, right? Um, also, are, is that high cash reserve, is that actually giving your team more of a complacent view on, cash flow in general. Right. Um, and, and, and then I think it's also easier for, for inefficiencies sometimes to, to kind of hide over time. And sometimes it, it, it's, it's not about what the metrics look like in that specific snapshot in time, but it's how it's trending. Right. So a company may not have a great cash reserve, but it might be trending in a lot better direction than actually a company that has a big cash reserve. So um, you want to make sure that that you're looking at the trends as well. And then keeping keeping the full picture of cash flow in mind, right? So and and it, it's it's huge for why companies should be making um, a high net profit. I know within companies that um, you know within the green industry, typically profit could be around seven to eight percent. But it's not uncommon for net cash flow to be almost at zero one percent, right? Um, and ultimately, you want to be a lot better than that. And 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 the reason for that is because even if you look at your revenues as a million dollar company, you know, and at two percent net income, you have the twenty twenty thousand dollars, right, of, of of your net income after taxes, paying off loans. You, you can see that that two percent net income is actually negative at the end of the day when it comes to your cash balance. So it's just another reason, you know. Just don't, don't, uh, you know. I I just want everyone to 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 really think about this year and you know look at last year. Even if you were in the position that you want to be financially, increase pricing. Look at what you could do with the efficiencies, right? Because if you want things to change. In your financials, you have to bring that change into your company, right? You have to make certain decisions that are different than what has been happening in the past. When it comes to the past, it tells you a story, right? This is this is net cash flow, as an example. You can see in specific months, there's a pattern here, right? Yeah. What are things you can do? Even going back to some of the initial slides that we went over, right? This company is having an issue in the slow season in, in the winter. Right? There's a lot of things that, that, that a company can do, right? So you want to consider all of them. Building up that cash reserve, right? This is something that we track for the companies we, we work with. Yeah. Uh, I want everyone to look at November 2022 and see how that cash reserve decreased into February, right? So it went from 64000 at the very top, and then in February 2023, it dropped all the way down to in the negative, right? So when you're thinking about next year, right, if there is going to be that much of an impact, you know, and if you do want to have, let's say, 35000 in the bank, <laughs> you know that instead of 
saving up 64,000 at November, you want to be in the 90s, right? Maybe 95,000 or 100,000, right? To to basically support some of those expenses as you as you enter into the winter time. Yeah. And that's a big topic for us. It's like analyzing this very graph and seeing cuz we base it off of two times fixed costs. So like fixed cost being items like um or administrative salaries, your telephone expense, just to make sure that you're going to have enough money in the winter time to give you that, you know, sense of security that you will have that money and being able to pay those expenses that don't go away just because you're slower. Yeah. And, and, and for those of you that are, that are looking to scale, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, one thing to, to consider is unit economics, right? Because when, when you're looking, instead of looking at, you know, kind of the journey of increasing a division from zero to 1.8 million, or whether you're starting off a company and looking to basically, basically do that, um, you know, I think you want to break it down into smaller pieces. And then it becomes a lot more of a practical way to look at it and an easier way to kind of manage it. So unit economics refers to the financial metrics that are used to evaluate the profitability and viability of a single unit within your business model, right? And an example of this is maybe you're, you're looking at a company, right? Where, where you have one crew within that one crew, you have three employees. And also within your business, you have 43 out of the 52 operating weeks in the year. And you know that in order for you to hit your profitability goal, that one crew needs to hit $450,000 per year or $10,500 per week. Now, how does that company, how do you grow to, to $1.8 million? Now, is it is that more of an easier and attainable goal, right? When, when Walmart scaled to billions... Right. It it they weren't thinking about a billion. They were thinking about how can we get that that one store to become very profitable. Right. So you need to think about your company like Walmart. Right. And each store being a crew or a, a specific unit within the company. And so if you decide to add on crews or um, expand keeping a close eye on these units and keeping a close eye on the profitability and the KPI targets of, of each of those units. And at, as a company grows, it it is not uncommon, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, for them to be less profitable at times, right? Because there's going to be more employee training that's involved in development and time that goes into that, more recruiting, onboarding. You're, you're going to be purchasing more fixed assets, right? So it's going to have a bigger impact on your cash flow. You're, you're going to be spending more money on marketing. You may have more debt because you're taking on more loans, right? So these are all things you can consider, especially when you're kind of thinking about, you know, your budget for the year. And we're we're wrapping up here, but this is basically, you know, looking at, um, you know, kind of the the, the reality when, when you scale a company is, We'll start with the graph over to the left. You want to base some of your uh, metrics off of the top line revenue, right? So basically looking at, okay, if your revenue is growing, are your overhead expenses growing at a faster rate? Are your direct costs growing at a faster rate? Because they shouldn't be, right? Um, so... Ideally, they should be growing at a very similar rate. Um, and and this, sometimes when you look at a bird's eye view, it, it, it kind of gives you clarity into that. And then when you look at the diagram to the right, you know, sometimes as, as a company grows, you, you may need to invest in a certain aspect of the company. And you may need to invest even before you have all the revenue to basically support that. Like if you're looking at point B, right? May, maybe that's a point where, you know, within a division, 
you know, you kind of had one person operating within it, but then you had to hire someone, right? An additional person in that division so that that initial person wasn't going to get too overwhelmed with all, with, with all the work. But at that very point, they were, you know, they, they weren't as profitable, right? Cause, cause now there's an additional person in there. They still need to get a, a you know, more clients to kind of hit, hit their capacity, you know, but, but I think that's part of the reality of scaling. So you want to make sure that, you know, ultimately over time you're, you're keeping track of, okay, are the overhead costs over an extended period of time, are they relatively growing at a similar rate to revenue? Because that's, that's what you want to see. So, um, and if, if anyone has, has questions, you know, you can always reach out to us. Um, I know we have some as well, um, you know, that, that, that everyone has, has asked too. So we have some questions. So, so um, Maria said, um, do all landscaping companies have to charge sales tax or they required to charge it? So usually um, more of the maintenance work is sales taxable. Um, it just really depends on the state that you are working in. So what I would do is I would go to that state's website um, department of revenue and they will break it down. Um, they'll have a section for just landscapers and then it'll they'll break it down what um, services are sales taxable and what services are not. You'll want to go into your CRM where you're so like if you're invoicing out of QuickBooks online um, and make sure that your invoices are collecting sales tax and remitting that to the state. So it could be monthly, um, quarterly, biannually or annually. Um, and if you have any other questions, I would re I would recommend just calling the state directly and they're pretty good at answering questions. Um, let's see. So someone said, what multiplier are you seeing for lawn maintenance companies selling for? So it's a four to six, right, Joe? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it could vary, um, uh, you know, based on, you know, more more the reoccurring based service lines could, you know, be anywhere between, you know, three to six. Three to six, yeah, that's what I've been seeing too. Said um, Nate said, would you recommend going from a one to three percentile or three to five if you can only move the needle in one spot? If I if I if I could only move the needle in one spot, then I would focus on the one to three, right? And and move those if I'm doing well in the three to five area. Because although three is average, I would just focus on the one to three. I think. And then let's see what else. Um, can you talk about commission versus profit sharing? Yeah, so commission is typically tied to sales related roles. Um, whereas profit sharing, that's more associated with incentivized um, payment structures for um, really any employee involved. So. Um, that's that's really kind of like the the overarching difference there. Yeah, I would say if if somebody is more sales focused and not really like having that entrepreneurial side to them, and you know they just want to you know sell sell sell, and they're in that mindset, which we know people with that personality, like you would want you know to pay them by commission versus someone who's profit sharing has more of like a broad view of the company is more wanting to see the company grow and, and focus on company initiatives and stuff like that. Awesome. All right. And then I know one of the questions was subcontractor or W2 employee. So that's actually something that the IRS basically decides, right? So um, when, when you're looking at, you know, if, if the company has control, um, over how the worker performs the work, when they perform it, right? Or um, the tools that they're using. Yeah, you know. So that's the 
those are all things that you kind of consider. And um, if if they are in control of those things, then it's an employee, and and that's how they should be classified. Yeah, W two. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So you know, definitely. Uh, um, you know, if anyone has has any additional questions, you can always you know reach out to us. But uh, you know, uh, I hope hope everyone has a has a great great rest of your night, and uh, hope you got some value from from the presentation. And we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you for your time, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a good night.